Thanks for joining us for Issues and Answers, The Declining Middle Class. I'm Fred Martino. In the last 15 years, every state in the country has seen a decline in the middle class. That's according to a Pew Charitable Trust study based on Census Bureau data. New Mexico and a number of other states saw about a 5% decline in middle class households. Only Wisconsin did worse, with a decline of about 6%. We'll hear different ideas on this situation from our guests and audience over the next hour. But first, what is going on? Let's take a look at the numbers, and there are a lot of numbers to get through. U.S. real median household income, real as in adjusted for inflation, has dropped about $5,000 since 1999. That's from the U.S. Census Bureau. Let's take a look now at how New Mexico is doing, and the answer is even worse than the rest of the country. About $10,000 less our real median household income, about $42,000, $52,000 for the United States. So who is doing well? Who isn't in this economy? U.S. worker pay over a much broader time period now, 1979 to 2013, you can see that Median wage workers, their pay only went up about 6%. Low wage workers' pay actually dropped 5%. High wage workers' pay was up 41%. Has it always been this way? Let's look at the same uh, statistics, but looking at U.S. productivity. Now, this is 1948 to 1973. You can see that hourly pay went up pretty much in conjunction with U.S. productivity. What about 1973 to 2013, though? How does it look there? Productivity still doing very well, up nearly 75 percent. Hourly pay, though, in that time period, only up a little more than 9 percent. So stockholders, CEOs, others, doing very well with productivity gains, but most workers not reaping much from this. And now the important part, especially for the state of New Mexico. I call it the unspoken disaster. No cost of living increases. This is very common, especially among government workers, and we have more of those in New Mexico than we do in many other states. If you can take a look at the math, it's pretty simple there. Average inflation is 2% a year. Uh, over five years, that's a 10% pay cut. The real pay cut, though, is larger for many who spend a high percentage of income on health care, food, and energy. Inflation in those areas is much more volatile and has tended to be higher than 2% a year. And so again, a very serious problem. We're here to talk about it with Paul Guessing. He's the president of the Rio Grande Foundation. Also joining us, Steve Fishman of the New Mexico Fair Lending Coalition and a former state legislator. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Great to be it's here. It's good to have you here. We're gonna start uh, with a few points that you wanted to make before we get to audience questions. And Paul, I'll begin with you. Your first point is, as we look at the economy, uh, you want to say that a strong economy benefits everyone, regardless of class or income level. So we need to focus on that. Yeah, this is especially true here in New Mexico, where for too long we've been very reliant on the federal dollars. We're a microcosm of some of the worst aspects of the data you just showed, where government workers highly educated, highly skilled, predominantly are doing very well, and the rest of New Mexico is not doing so well. Uh, a liberal organization, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, found that New Mexico is the most unequal state of any in the country. That's both, both in terms of the gap between high level and middle class and high level and lower income. Uh, we really desperately need to develop a private sector economy here in our state. Okay, Steve, uh, one of your points, and again related to your work right now with the New Mexico Fair Lending Coalition, is that we need to restore appropriate financial industry regulations from big banks down to payday lenders. Yeah, uh, 
I think a, a poorly understood fact is that about 40 percent of our economy now is devoted to finance and real estate. And these are not productive industries. These are industries that are just shuffling money around and trying to gain temporary advantages by parking at one place or another. And during our last financial crisis and our last Great Recession, uh, the government made a very uh, clear decision that it was going to help banks, that it wasn't going to help people. And uh, uh, Paul may agree with me on this one. I don't know. I Certainly Ron Paul agrees with me. <laughs> we should have helped people instead of helping banks. There was lots of ways to restructure the banking industry. The government had all the cards to do that. They had the money but we chose to protect the banks. And we're still dealing with this, right? I mean, uh, more than half in, the, in a recent Gallup poll, 56% of people said that the economy was getting worse, even though we're in a recovery, supposedly. Getting to your point about financial industry regulations, you uh, tried to get legislation passed in the state of New Mexico in the session this year to cap interest. I believe it was at 36%, right? Correct. Other states have done this and, and you failed. Why do you think that, the, that, that this failed in the legislature? Uh, well, there's just a lot of money and influence from the industry. They had 24 lobbyists roaming the halls, talking to legislators. They had the money to hire those 24 lobbyists. 24 people. 24. Okay, very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul, one of the points that you want to make in this program is that, and, and we started the program with a lot of statistics about pay, and that is important, but you say we, we can't just look at pay, that, that we also need to look at living standards, and your point is, uh, with the numbers you look at, living standards for everyone have improved in recent decades. Right, and you cited in your uh, opening remarks a lot of different data focused on different time periods. But overall, a lot of people talk about 1970 on being a stagnation in the middle class. And the thing with employee pay that is often not contemplated, for example, is benefits, especially health care. Now, we could have a whole different discussion about the reforms to health care and whether those are going to be we successful or not. We don't have time for that. You know. However, <laughs> there is one point to be made, and that is that health care costs for decades now have been far outstripping uh, inflation rates and income growth. And so people, on the average, do not see that in their bottom line as uh, the take-home pay, but it is a very significant expense for businesses who are paying that as a benefit. So we have uh, numbers that aren't necessarily clearly illustrating the story. But also, what passes for poor in the United States, people often have things that were not even products available, say, in 1970, or even for decades beyond that. Cell phones, cable TV, uh, air conditioning in every room of their house, two cars in the household. A lot of these things are uh, available because while their number that they're bringing home is not as significant uh, or it hasn't grown as much, the things they can buy with that are uh, improving and expanding. Okay, and that's an interesting issue and something that, that we do need to consider. Steve, uh, you say though uh, we, we still have to look at wages and you talk about the importance of comprehensively addressing minimum wage, wage structure, and also wage theft issues, which recently, as you know, the federal government came out and said uh, that in, in terms of wage theft, we're talking about, in, in their uh, analysis, uh, close to two million people uh, a year uh, experiencing wage theft as well. Yeah, uh, and actually the, the statistics I've seen would say that's a huge underestimate. Um, and I, I, we're engaged in this strange cycle um, in, the, in the way we're running our policy now, is that we do a lot of things that prevent or take money from folks who don't have a lot. Uh, it could be predatory lending. It could be low minimum wages. Uh, it could be a whole series of policies. Um, lottery scholarship. Poor people are the ones who buy those lottery tickets. Well, it's families with $80,000 of income who get all the scholarships. And only 30% of those funds that we collect through the lottery scholarship actually go 
to scholarships. So it's incredibly wasteful. And it all comes from the poor. Um, so uh, what I would say is we should really think carefully about being sure that people get a fair amount, that we don't then take it from them, and that if we did that, perhaps we wouldn't have to spend so much money on government assistance programs. And I have to say we do a very efficient job of taking money away from low income and middle class people, but the welfare programs do a very inefficient job of redressing the problem. I say, let's stop doing both. Okay, very interesting. And, and I'm sure this is an issue, very broad one that we'll get into more as we have audience questions coming up. Paul, uh, we'll get into this more as well. You say that New Mexico is poor and unequal. Those are your words. Yep. But you also say it can be changed and your solution is free market, economic, and education reforms. Touch on this for me briefly. Well, before I jump into that, I want to agree with something Steve said, which is that uh, higher education in New Mexico, the lottery scholarships. So that's one policy additionally that could be changed. But at the federal level, the whole student loan program is both driving up the cost of education for young people while only benefiting the 20 to 25 percent of uh, students who ultimately graduate from college. So that it's important to look at both uh, data points as we sit here at an Institute of Higher Learning, Learning in New Mexico. Uh, but the other things, tax reform, uh, the gross receipts tax in particular is an extremely harmful tax. It is a regressive tax here in New Mexico and the best way to uh, avoid the gross receipts tax or ameliorate its impact for many businesses today is to go up to Santa Fe and as Steve says, hire a lobbyist and get your exemption. There's different ways to address the issue. You could go to a straight sales tax that would, that would cause some revenue situations for the state or you drop the, uh, the rate dramatically and expand and broaden that tax. There's different ways to uh, address the gross receipts tax but it definitely impacts negatively small businesses, entrepreneurs who are starting, trying to start jobs here in our state and get the economic growth going. A education system, uh, what can I say? Uh, school choice, accountability for our system is imperative. We need more options for students in New Mexico. We need the accountability to be driven not by regulations coming out of Santa Fe, but by empowered parents and uh, students who can take their money where they want to and hold the schools accountable that way and demand the services that, that are best for them, whether it's vocational or some other model of education. Something, desperately needed in New Mexico. Something else that would be an hour-long show, for sure, Definitely. I can bet you. Uh, final point before we move on in the second part of our show, uh, Steve, uh, and this is a really important one because New Mexico spends millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, every year in terms of trying mm. to boost economic opportunity. And you say, these are your words, we need to enact statutes, statutes to reduce this is, again, your words, out of control, local, state, and federal corporate giveaways. Absolutely. Um, as a legislator, I sat in committee meetings uh, where I would see one government department come into a meeting and tell us how they created 200 jobs uh, by giving some special giveaway to uh, a particular venture. Fifteen minutes later, another department comes in and they tell about how they created 200 jobs with their special giveaway. And those state agencies didn't know what each other had done, much less what other giveaway that company might have gotten from local governments in terms of IRBs or whatever else. And God knows, you know, what happened at the federal level, and there's a lot of, a lot of that going on. And what's interesting is if you look at the research, communities that have invested heavily in corporate incentives have shown no greater economic growth than communities that have not. And this is interesting, Steve, because again, it's another point where you and Paul might agree. Paul has been a guest on many programs before on, on uh, newsmakers and other shows where, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, I mean, your philosophy is rather than picking winners and losers, it's a broad-based cut taxes, 
uh, or other ways to I incentivize the economy That's rather right. than picking winners as losers. I just want to make one point, though. Uh, we can debate till the cows come home whether certain tax incentives work or don't work and whether they should be done or not done. But the worst and most generous by far that this state gives is for the film industry where for every dollar you spend in New Mexico, you get 25 or even 30 cents back from the taxpayers of New Mexico. We can argue whether certain industries should be given tax breaks that they don't have to pay tax burden, but taking money out of the treasury to give to one specific industry is not just economically bad judgment, it's morally wrong in my opinion. Okay. And I will quickly jump in and say I agree with Paul on that, and I, I know a lot of my progressive friends uh, disagree with me on that, and I consider myself a progressive, but I think Paul is absolutely right on that one. Okay. And this is another example, in, in my opinion, of looting the poor, because what happens is funds that could have been spent on truly needed government programs that help people out are instead getting diverted to a, a particular industry. Okay. And when we calculate the economic benefits, I don't see anyone calculating the economic loss that happens when we take money away from those people to give to the film industry. They calculate the benefit to the film industry, but you haven't calculated the damage okay. and the economic opportunity you've stopped by taking that resource away from low-income people. It's all about context. That's why we have an hour here. And in a moment, we'll have questions from our studio audience. As we continue our discussion, full disclosure, KRWG personnel are state employees. Many existing state programs were frozen at last year's funding, essentially budget cuts when you adjust for inflation. However, a $50 million subsidy for the film and TV industry continued, as we just noted and more than $37 million in new money was provided to an incentive fund to attract business. Google's Triton Aerospace, one of the companies that benefited from state incentives, recently announced it was leaving New Mexico. It's just the latest in a list of New Mexico companies moving or cutting back. The Martinez administration points to new companies coming in, including an overseas aerospace company planning to build in Las Cruces. That company has been promised a half a million dollars in state money, along with local funds as well. Critics say the answer is not more economic incentives. Instead, it's something called economic gardening, building infrastructure, great roads, schools, parks, and cultural attractions, and offering programs that help people who are already here rather than a handful of out-of-state investors. But as Simon Thompson reports, an incentive program for New Mexico citizens has a waiting list because all it got was $100,000. New Mexico has been one of the state's slowest to bounce back from the recession. That could be because the state's primary approach to economic growth has been using incentives and tax exemptions to lure big business. NMSU professor of economics Chris Erickson says the state is moving in the wrong direction. Economic development is an ocean liner, you're steering the ocean liner, and right now uh, Las Cruces in New Mexico generally I think is steering towards the rocks because we're focused on developing short-term solutions, on getting quick fixes, when we need to steer the ship back into the channel uh, where we focus on what creates real economic development. Erickson says states that have had stronger trajectories of growth like Oregon and Colorado have taken a different grow from within approach known as economic gardening. Instead of giving incentives to out-of-state businesses, assistance is geared to help local firms. The states also enhance infrastructure to make the region a more attractive place to live and do business. Grow within type of policies which are aimed at helping businesses to grow. Then you have uh, 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 another set of policies that uh, are uh, involved developing amenities, parks, recreation, uh, uh, th th that kind of thing. Which, and you know, let's face it, people like to live places where it's pleasant. They like to live near parks. They like to live near recreational activities. And if you have those available in your community and you can promote them and develop them then that can result in attracting businesses into your community. 
There are regional examples of this approach, like the Organ Mountains Desert Peaks National Monument designation, street improvements, and a future plaza in downtown Las Cruces, and state assistance programs like individual development accounts. Individual development accounts provide eligible New Mexicans with training and a state-matched savings account to help them pay for education, buy their first home, or start a business. So the Cabertolde, it's an Amarone. Jessica McKenzie is the owner-manager of Bella Luca, an Italian restaurant in Truth or Consequences. She took part in the program eight years ago as she was establishing her business. Every little bit helps, so it was, I mean, it was worthwhile for us to do the classes and to go to the program and um, have the little, uh, the couple of extra grand to help us make the dream a reality. Mackenzie saved $1,000 and received four times that, $4,000 from the state. Mackenzie says she would have saved more if she could have, but the one-time matched savings program is capped at $4,000. So Mackenzie got most of the half million dollars it cost to set up the business from investments and loans. The extent of it is really limited. Um, I, I don't think there's very many businesses that could open for, for five grand. And I think that the types of businesses that could open for just the five grand, if that was what one was limited to as their opening budget. Um, I, I don't think that there would be businesses with the staying power of, for example, my business, um, based on the fact that I, obviously I had a great deal of other investment money to start my business. So yeah, I can only imagine if a young family were able to get 50,000 or, you know, something that, uh, was really could approach opening a real viable long-term business. If this one-time individual development account for New Mexico businesses seems measly, that's because it is, especially when compared to the 25 to 30 percent reimbursements for film and television production. New Mexico has set aside 50 million dollars a year for the film industry, but only 100,000 dollars will fund this year's individual development account program. Erickson says even though film incentives and other perks for businesses are not always rational economically, they may make sense politically, especially in the lead up to elections. Politicians like that because they can use tax incentives to, get a, to, to attract a business and to bring them to the community short term. It gives them a short term hit. It's kind of like a heroin hit. Let's, get, let's, let's use tax incentives to get, people, to get short term gratification to impress the voters of what we're able to do, whereas uh, real economic development takes decades. While the opening of Bella Luca may not have warranted a ribbon cutting ceremony or a press conference, they do employ 16 full time staff in the summer and 10 in the off season. And Erickson says companies owned by locals like Jessica McKenzie typically have more staying power than firms lured in by incentives and managed out of state. You're more ingrained in the fabric of your community. I mean, myself, for example, has served as chamber president and served as on my tourism board. Um, my staff, my coworkers are, are my friends. You know, I work side by side with them. So, yeah, there's a deeper emotional connection to my own work and to the level of pride that I try to inspire within my staff. Darwin Lopez is the CEO of Mavida, the Mesilla Valley Economic Alliance, one of the many organizations in the state working to attract new jobs. He says while economic gardening sounds good in theory, implementing the approach in New Mexico is a lot more complicated, particularly with the state's low skilled workforce and difficulty retaining the state's college graduates. We've been a state that's so reliant on federal dollars coming in, we haven't had to work hard or hard enough to or have the desire to really build a private sector industry where a lot of these students can move into and stay here in the region. So where do they go? It's natural. They're going to leave. They're going to either leave the region or they're going to leave the state altogether. So we're exporting our greatest talent. But Lopez says there does need to be more long-term investment in infrastructure, workforce development and quality of life initiatives. However, he says those long-term efforts can be difficult because Mavita's success is measured in the short term. For me in my world, I'm, I'm asked to 
perform every year. We have to be positively performing every year. So I can't wait. Lopez says the region and state as a whole could benefit from a longer term perspective in generating economic development. Whether that happens or not, Lopez says economic development boards will continue to leverage everything available to them to bring jobs to their regions, including all the business incentives and tax exemptions the state, cities and counties have to offer. For KRWG, I'm Simon Thompson. Excellent story there, and it puts it into perspective, a very important issue. You know, when we first ran that story earlier in 2015, like all of our stories, we put it up on krwg.org on the website. And almost immediately, we got a comment from a gentleman named Ray Hagerman. Here's what he said. I couldn't agree more with Chris Erickson's thoughts here. It's about time someone took a public stand. I'm the CEO of Four Corners Economic Development in Farmington, and I've been preaching this since I got here two years ago from Ohio. Growing your own and equipping your own is not nearly as glamorous as recruiting, but it's what wins in the end. Again, that was Ray Hagerman. He is still the CEO of Four Corners Economic Development in Farmington. We have our first question now from an audience member for our guest, Paul Guessing of the Rio Grande Foundation and Steve Fishman of the New Mexico Fair Lending Coalition. Hi. Hi, my name is Rich Markman. Um, my first sentence is, uh, in my uh, history, I managed a uh, clerical unit in a large insurance company of about 40 people. These were entry level jobs for high school graduates. Um, now that I've noticed cultural change in corporate, corporate America, now that uh, college graduates are competing for burger flipping jobs, what do high school graduates look forward to? Okay. Good question. I mean, this, you know, while the economy uh, has been difficult for college graduates, we in fact, in the last 10 years, uh, studies say that uh, when you look at the entry level pay, for college graduates, it's not what it used to be. It's actually gone down. Uh, but for folks who, who do not have a college education, it is even more difficult. Let's start with you, Paul, on this, because you, you talked about in the, in the opening segment, education mm -hmm. being a, a really important part of our discussion. And I think a lot of people would say, uh, aside from school choice, which you emphasize, that public schools uh, cannot forget vocational training in high school so that for folks who do not go on to some post-secondary education, they leave with the ability to find employment. That's right. There's a lot of good information contained in that question. And certainly uh, the ability of New Mexico and the United States as a whole to create a high-skilled workforce is, uh, is challenged by an inefficient education system. Worse probably here in New Mexico than nationally, but definitely uh, something that we need desperately to change and improve because uh, there is a competition around the world for that low skilled labor. Uh, now you could probably do a lot of the activities that he's talking about uh, via the internet or something with India or China or some other nation and you don't want to be someone without a high school diploma who is competing with literally the world for some of these jobs because that is going to make you competing for less jobs and for less wages. America should be at a point where we're generating more and more high skilled jobs to offset that decline in the low skilled workforce and our education system definitely is one of the big things that we need to address. And Steve, we should point out here, in terms of getting vocational training, one of the beauties of this, and again, this is often just totally ignored in our discussion about education, unlike a lot of high-skilled jobs, you can't outsource a plumber. <laughs> At least not yet, right? <laughs> I mean, if you, need, if you need somebody to fix the sink, uh, you know, that isn't going to be done via the computer in, in, in another country, right? I mean, this is something we got to talk about. Uh, well, you know, I think that's true, and I think that's, you know, where the minimum wage discussion really comes into play as well. Um, I, you know, the vision of generating more and more high-skilled jobs is terrific, uh, but the reality is um, there's kind of a ceiling there, and it, there's only so many really high-skilled jobs uh, that you're going to have out there, and there's going to be a lot of jobs that aren't so highly skilled. 
Um, so while that's a great aspiration to have, we have to understand that it has its limits. Yeah. Um, when it comes to education, I think what we need to be looking at, and what frustrates me about all the education furor and how it relates to the economy, is I look at schools and I, my perception is that schools do not do a very good job of teaching life skills. We do educational, we teach, you know, we talk about academic stuff, we talk about math, this, that, and the other. Well, kids graduate, they don't have financial literacy. Uh, so they get, you know, the work I do, they get stuck in these terrible loans because they don't understand what they're doing. Well, why didn't we have a class before they graduated that teaches them about rent, about bank accounts, about, and why don't we include that in our math and, and uh, civics curriculum all along the way? Um, and I, my wife used to work as a, an HR person uh, for one of our local call centers. And she found that kids didn't even have basic skills about how to present themselves in the workplace. Well, for God's sakes, they've been going to school for 12, 13 years, and we don't have kind of the basic civility and presentation skills in place. I think we need to, in New Mexico in particular, put a lot more emphasis on that aspect of education. I think that's just totally lost in our current education debate. Very important issue. We have another question. Hi. Hi, I'm Robin Hastings. I teach an astronomy class for the local community college. I will agree, we have sometimes lousy infrastructure. Like, why don't we have a road to the space port at this point? <laughs> sometimes we have poor education. Sometimes we have problems overwhelming us. And yet, I came from a land of foul air and overcrowded roads. I love it here. I don't like Los Angeles. <laughs> what are the strengths of New Mexico? What are the great things that can attract people here? Good question. Let's start with you, Steve, on this one. And, and this is also part, right, of, of economic uh, development, is sharing the story. And uh, I know one of the things that's been touted recently uh, as a way to do this is tourism. You know, if you get people to visit, they may decide uh, to move here one day, uh, either during their work life or in retirement. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, tourism is one thing we can work on. Uh, I think all the evidence shows us that tourism doesn't generate high paying jobs. And if you look at tourist communities really throughout the world, uh, you'll find most of the workforce tends to be on the lower paid scale. Do, do we do a good enough job selling the assets of New Mexico? Uh, I, uh, I moved here about seven years ago and I love New Mexico, uh, just like uh, our, our guest. Uh, do we need to do a better job of, uh, of that, and what would that entail? Well, we need to do a much better job of that. I'll tell you, I, I moved from California, and I hate Los Angeles, too, <laughs> and I love New Mexico. And one of the things that I love about New Mexico is there's a sense of freedom. Um, it's not so crowded. It's not so busy. It's not so um, overwhelmed with people that were buried in regulations. You have freedoms to do a lot more things in New Mexico than you could do in New York or Los Angeles or a big city. And we need to find ways to leverage that because that means a lot for businesses that come here. Um, Paul, your thoughts on this and, and you know, freedom yeah. is, a, is a big part of your tagline in the sure. Rio Grande uh, Foundation. But, but getting to this question uh, of, of, of marketing the, the state, and it, not just to, to, uh, to businesses, but to individuals as well, that this is a good place to live. Well, we do have wide open spaces and a relatively pristine environment. And that being said, I want to shift to Ray Hagerman, the Four Corners Economic Development Director, and talk about some of the, you know, high skilled in the sense that driving a forklift or a bulldozer or an excavating device are high skilled jobs as well. And we're in the process of shutting down a perfectly viable coal plant up in the Four Corners area due to not even health concerns. Uh, the Obama Hayes rec uh, regulation is not about improving health, it's about impacts relative on Hayes and national parks. And you can look at photos of currently and under the new requirement, and it's actually 
can't even see by the human eye. So these are high-skilled jobs that through government regulations we are getting rid of in an area where it is deeply depressed economy. A lot of this is on the Navajo reservation and these are uh, Native Americans losing their jobs. So uh, I think we need to sell the things we can offer in outdoor activities, the unique cultural aspects, but we have to balance that with creation of jobs and inexpensive, affordable electricity that's also reliable. Okay, another question. Yes, I'm Peter Goodman. Uh, you folks were mentioning the student loan programs and the, the fact that uh, that benefits only a few students. But as far as I can tell, the real scandal in that program is a kind of free enterprise gone mad in the uh, very many for-profit, uh, quote-unquote, colleges that bring people in often on, you know, with no chance of succeeding, um, don't care if they succeed, uh, the colleges don't. Um, they know that they're going to get these federally guaranteed loans uh, paid to them, even if all the students flunk out. Uh, so my question is, are you, it's a twin question, are you aware of that problem and how would you address it? Steve, Thank let's you. start with you on that and, and that question of, of this issue because you deal a lot with uh, financial institutions and concerns yeah. about them. Um, uh, to me, this is another area of excess in the financial industry and where we've literally put law in place to uh, help loot folks who don't have m uh, much in the way of assets to begin with. How is it that a student loan cannot be refinanced to current market rates? You take out a loan and you're stuck, millions of students are stuck at a high interest rate uh, that happened well before we, we hit our current economic circumstances. Well, why are we protecting these folks who are just taking money? They're not providing anything productive. All they're doing is they've got this income stream and they're saying, we're not letting it go. And by the way, you don't have the freedom to refinance. Why do they get special rights? Um, I think we just have to absolutely review that student loan policy one other aspect of this is that we have to be careful with student loans because I think to some degree uh, they've also fed the rapid increase in the cost of education. Uh, when we make financing options look too easy, we create market bubbles. And uh, that happened in real estate. And I think to some degree it's happening in education and, and with insurance and medicine. Quick thoughts on this, Paul? There's nothing free market about the student loan program and those requirements inherent in that uh, is not something that we, sh we as free market advocates should have to defend. Now, uh, higher education in general and the presence of uh, private sector, non-government entities, I think it can work. It doesn't mean that it's working well now, but that is a function of government policies relating to these programs and the incentives that Steve rightly points out. Uh, create create problems. Uh, there is definitely room for private sector involvement in higher education provision, especially in some of the more vocationally oriented uh, uh, type fields. Okay, another question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul O'Connell. I uh, teach economics over at Donana Community College. I have worked with Steve's lovely bride and kept me in line. And, uh, but anyway, my question is about the last two legislative sessions. Uh, through various shenanigans and so forth, they reduced business and corporate tax rates. At the same time, over the last 10, 12 years, support for both K-12 and at the university, the support has gone down. And uh, consequently, recently, the university had to increase the tuition and it's been increasing. I still feel the university here in New Mexico State still is a, is a good bargain, don't get me wrong. But nevertheless, and any company that comes into the, any state, any place they wanna go, they say their top need is educated people and being accessed to broadband computer. Down the list is tax breaks. That's not why they come to any market. So my question is, does that seem like a rational policy to reduce the support for K through 12 and through and uh, at the university and uh, at the same time increasing the cost of education for the parents? 
Okay, this isn't theoretical to you, Steve, because you were a state legislator, so you had to, to deal with these decisions on votes. And, and what's your thought about this? Because again, that was kind of the, the premise of the beginning of our show, and something you said, look, we always talk, when we talk about economic incentives and programs, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, simply uh, what, what's the payoff, but we don't talk about the opportunity cost. Where, where else could this have mo money have gone? Exactly, and um, tax is, is, a, is a tough area, and it's, it's particularly tough when we talk corporate tax because we have LLCs now, which essentially allow a lot of corporate type entities to avoid corporate tax altogether. Um, do we need to tax corporate entities? Yes, we do. They need to pay their fair share for all the infrastructure we build for them. Um, uh, I think just about everybody in the legislature would agree we want to get rid of a lot of the incentives and, and flatten it. But when it comes to actual votes and they have a constituent standing there, suddenly the theory goes out the window. Um, to me, this is an issue of political courage. Are, willing, are we willing to stand up and help our economy out long term by saying we will engage in a 10 year long program that we will gradually eliminate 90% of the unnecessary lobbyist induced uh, special tax breaks that we have put into the code. And, and are you willing to gradually piss off each one of those constituencies and, as you and, do it? And of course, in this case, uh, Steve, this gets to another point that you made earlier, uh, which is who's paying for all of this? Of course, in the case of, of these uh, tax cuts, the corporate tax cuts, uh, individuals are paying and it's a regressive uh, uh, pay because gross receipts tax went, went up in a lot of different communities. So, so super regressive thing going on, fewer and fewer corporate taxes, more and more corporate incentives, more and more pushing wealth to stockholders who represent a very small percentage of the population. Right. And that's part of the problem. Paul, I'll let you get on with this. We, we have another question, but go ahead. Yeah, this is a complicated one to unpack, but it was a myth that this was a net tax reduction. Uh, we're in the midst of a process of reducing corporate income taxes, which are an extremely small and extremely volatile source of revenue for the state. Corporate taxes and should be reduced not because they're morally right or morally wrong, but because they are another reason that employers do not come to New Mexico and they go instead to Texas, which has a 0% corporate income and personal income tax rate. That's why we reduce and eliminate corporate income taxes. Now, if I was the governor, I would have said we need to reduce uh, or eliminate this tax because it is a very small source of revenue. Unfortunately, the raising of the gross receipts tax, not something I would have advocated for and did not advocate for. And I would take issue with the last statement that the gentleman made. K-12 spending, to my knowledge, has not been reduced, certainly not on a per-pupil basis in New Mexico. Higher ed spending, has been somewhat reduced. However, New Mexico needs to significantly reevaluate its higher ed system. We have a proliferation of campuses and various universities. There could be a lot of consolidation, both in terms of campuses and uh, degree programs where we, you know, UNM and NMSU should be the flagships, and then they should be more uh, uh, focal points rather than having separate universities in Portales and Northern New Mexico and all over the state. It's a lot of money, especially in a time of constraint. We need to evaluate that, but it's a very difficult thing to do. Again, courage in Santa Fe. Okay, another question. Good afternoon. My name is Dinah Gentian. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. My question is, uh, New Mexico economy is so heavily based on uh, the extractive industries. Um, we have been blessed so far with abundant coal, oil, and gas, but what happens when we run out? Uh, it's the, at every turn, the war cry is drill, baby, drill. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the quicker, the more we uh, mine and pump, the quicker we run out. Uh, who is planning ahead for when we do run out of these uh, natural extractive industries? What are we going to do then? Is there any plan in place to gradually uh, take over that piece of our economy with uh, a more sustainable program? That's a really good question. So Steve, as a, as a former state legislator, let me ask you that question. 
uh, your experience in, in Santa Fe. Do, do we ever the, look at long term? I mean, this is a criticism not just of, of, of government at state level, but also local and federal, that it's always short term. It isn't long term. Well, I, I sat on the Conservation Committee, uh, which I nicknamed the Drill Baby Drill Committee. And that was because all of my co-committee members came from oil producing districts in New Mexico. And clearly they were protecting their districts and protecting the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, you can't just suddenly shut it off, but you do have to have uh, a long-term plan in place to transition. And that's for a lot of reasons. And quite frankly, um, when you're, there's lots of room for us to do things with the renewable energy economy. And so, uh, uh, solar energy now is cheaper than natural gas in many cases, and it's proven so for our own utility here, EPE. Is there anything, uh, Steve, in your view, uh, having the experience being in Santa Fe, that could get a, a, f a bigger focus on the long term? Getting at her question, you know, planning. We we you know we may not we may not lose the uh, extractive industries. Uh, in the next in the next decade, it may be long in the future, but planning for that that future. Well, uh, the short answer is in the long term, we're all dead, and so is my <laughs> political career. So uh, there is no quick answer to that. I, I think the the answers tend to be short term, but I think in the next five years, as battery costs are coming down, electricity storage, um, we're going to see that the economics push us. Paul, doesn't this really get to another point, uh, which is that, again, just like so many other things, focusing on the long term is difficult because in the short term, uh, you have a, a need uh, to raise money for campaigns. And, uh, you know, we heard Steve talk earlier about, you know, the bill that he tried to pass uh, on restricting interest rates to 36 percent didn't pass. Uh, something that's passed in other states because there were, was it 24 lobbyists that were running around Santa? I mean, how do we deal with that, that kind of pressure? Well, I want to answer the, the woman's question, and uh, she forgot the most significant extractive industry in New Mexico, which is our reliance on the federal government and our extracting taxpayers <laughs> from pockets of the 49 other states. That is the biggest extractive industry in our state. Now, I would also uh, say that in a sense, these are not finite resources. I know that that flies in the face of a lot of common knowledge, but going back to Paul Ehrlich and the Club of Rome in the 1970s, the idea that we were going to run out of oil and gas just around the corner. Well, just around the corner not only never came, but the uh, expected ability for us to drill and mine and do all these things, we have more uh, of those resources available known on the, about. On the flip side though, Paul, of course, I mean, and we're dealing with this right now. There, there, are, there are grave potential consequences. I mean, the huge uh, pollution stream that we're seeing going down uh, the, the Animus River. Caused by the uh, EPA. And uh, well, yes. And uh, one thing often not reported though is that the federal government offered to make that a Superfund site and try to clean it up a long Some time ago. Some say they did it to cause and, it to become a Superfund and, uh, site. And so, you know, this, the, the, there are environmental concerns with, mm -hmm. with drilling and, and of all types of different extractive industries. So uh, again though, to focus on the long term, uh, do you see this, this, this question of campaign uh, finance as an impediment to that sometimes? In a short answer, no, I don't. Uh, not in the same way that Steve does, certainly. Uh, and I, I, as an organization dedicated to the free market, also see the issues with whether it's corporate or other money frequently being counter to the free market. Some, assume that the, the corporate interests are always trying to push the free market agenda. Well, corporate interests by and large are trying to push their own agenda. Sometimes that dovetails with the free market. A lot of times it doesn't. But ultimately we have not a money problem in politics. We have a government problem in the economy. And until we tail, pair back government's role in our economy and destroy the incentive for somebody to spend 50,000 in Santa Fe, 
for a contract or something that's going to squash competition that means tens of millions of dollars to them, the idea of campaign finance reform is, uh, to say it bluntly, useless. So uh, we're not going to keep money out of politics. It ultimately is free speech. The Supreme Court has said that. And we need to move on towards how do we develop an economy based on free market principles that works for and everyone. As you know, some disagree, including our Senator Tom Udall, who's looking for a constitutional amendment to deal with the campaign finance issue. And Steve, I'll I have another make a question. Real quick comment here, which uh, is: real quick, government is not a market; it's not there to be bought and sold. Fixing campaign finance is core to getting where we need to go. Okay. Another question, uh, Mayor Pro Tem for Las Cruces, Greg Smith. Hi, Greg. Thank you. Hi, Fred. And yes, on the government question, since I am a counselor here in Las Cruces, the question I have for both of you is what can you advise a government, uh, especially a local one, as far as one or two things specifically that would help in this disappearing middle class question. What can we be doing, either getting out of the way or in putting something in place that, from your perspective that would help in, in building that middle class? Okay, Steve, let's start with you. Two things that you think the state could do, two most important things, to boost the middle class. Um. Well, one of them I think you brought up right at the beginning. Move incentives away from the kind of trickle down. Uh, I know that's a politically charged deal, but stop giving all the incentives to big, rich corporate entities. Start working more from the bottom up. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that those statistics you pointed out at the beginning of the program uh, started in 1979. Well, that's when we started deregulating financial markets. Uh, that's when we started um, a lot of privatization stuff that didn't really work out. And that's when we started a lot of the trickle-down incentives. Second thing. Um, the second one is address the financial industry. Um, stop protecting them with rip-offs. Um, uh, I'm working with the payday loans. Government doesn't just tolerate it. We sponsor it. We give all of these 400 and 500% lenders licenses. We never say no. We said no to about 3,000 applications over the last seven, eight years. Why are we sponsoring these people with licenses? Okay, two, two most important things in your view uh, the state could do, Paul. At the state level, there are so many that it's hard to boil it down to just two, but I will. One is, as we addressed earlier, the gross receipts tax needs to be either completely done away with or at least reduced dramatically in rate, and some protection needs to be put there so that special interests can't, again, turn it into the Swiss cheese with a high rate that's taxed on unevenly on many different individuals. The second thing is, and Rio Grande Foundation has been tracking job growth in right-to-work versus non-right-to-work states. Right-to-work simply means you cannot be told to join a union, required to join a union as a precondition of employment, and 25 states have it, 25 states don't. About 80% of the new jobs created this year are in right-to-work states, and right-to-work states, including our neighbors, Texas, uh, Nevada, Arizona, et cetera, have been generating far, far more jobs than the states that lack And Paul, you've introduced another hour-long show again. <laughs> another question. Hello, um, my name is Brandy Lozada Johnston, and uh, um, I, Technology is, is the way or the state of the future. Uh, Bioengineering, 3D marketing, making products, and even having our 3D printers in each home. Uh, but mostly the trend of robots working and um, that are able to replace workers at a much more efficient and effective way. How can we not be adding this information to our discussion uh, when we are talking about economy, education, and um, how our society can take advantage of some of this wonderful technology and solar and um, batteries. You know, it seems like it's a new paradigm shift and we're not addressing it. Okay, and very interesting. And it's actually the cover story in the Atlantic Magazine, this idea that uh, uh, robots, computers, additional uh, uh, opportunities to automate will eliminate more and more middle class and higher middle class jobs. Again, 
uh, Steve, this, this again gets to this point of, of long-term planning in our economy. Our economic planning cannot be just short term. It has to look 5, 10, 15, 20 years out. And her point is a very good one, right? Uh, it's a very sound point. And, you know, to me, it speaks to this idea that if we have robust markets, that means everybody will be able to get a job. Well, you know, with the amount of ob uh, automation that's going on, I don't know if we should be making assumptions like that. I think we need to look carefully at what might happen to the economy and think differently about how people can contribute to society and how we can find roles for everybody. But it may not be through the, the traditional private economy if we have robots taking over lots and lots of functions at a fast food store. Uh, could a robot serve? Well, you know, probably not too long that could happen. Um, okay, Paul. And if you keep raising the minimum wage, as Steve says, <laughs> you will have more and more robots at, at those food outlets and uh, serving people, whether it's at grocery stores. Uh, and that's one of the areas that I definitely disagree with Steve on is the, the raising in the minimum wage because you're literally cutting out the, the bottom rungs of the employment ladder. Minimum wage jobs aren't for uh, you know, people who are long-term in the workforce, highly skilled, they're for relatively low-skilled people. And I think that's where the robots, along with competition from all over the world, are having their, their impact. But I do want to address, again, it's, I don't think that this is anything new. We have had automation in our society, in our workforce for hundreds of years now. Uh, the Luddites smashed the, I think was printing presses or some technology because they thought it was going to cost them their jobs. And if we abandon technological progress for the need of job growth, uh, we're going to be hamstringing wealth creation in our economy. It's not about working harder, having a, a job that you spend more time at. It's about productivity and the wealth that's generated. And c machines have been great in uh, benefiting that long term. Paul Guessing is the president of the Rio Grande Foundation. Steve Fishman of the New Mexico Fair Lending Coalition. Gentlemen, always a pleasure to have you here. Great you to be Fred? here. And thank you to our audience for wonderful questions on this program. And we want to thank you at home because in-depth local journalism is only possible because of you. You can become a member or renew your membership anytime online at krwg.org. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week.